Music of the Islands on Aloha Friday afternoon, coming up to 1 p.m. It's just another beautiful day in paradise, with trade winds blowing at 15 to 20 miles per hour. And the temperature is... 15 million degrees. Puhi Pau, blown away, completely burnt. Hello, my name is Mabel de Cambra, and I live out here on the Waianae coast. I'm married and I have two beautiful children. I'd like to talk with you about nuclear war. Actually, the term war is misleading. A war usually has winners and losers. And the winners usually win something. But in a thermonuclear exchange, only the bombs win. Because nuclear war is not war, but the extinction of all life. I guess you've heard it all before. The mass deaths and destruction, the unspeakable horror. Nuclear weapons have been around for almost 40 years, ever since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Everyone says there's nothing we can do about it, except hope that no one gets crazy enough to push the button. Meanwhile, we continue to work another eight hour day, eat, sleep, and live our lives. We don't seem to want to think about the sword that's hanging inches above our heads. There are several groups here in Hawaii which feel that our choices are simple, peace or annihilation. One of these groups is the Hawaii chapter of a worldwide organization, the Physicians for Social Responsibility. Over 15,000 doctors and their associates are educating their colleagues, their patients, and the public about the medical effects of a nuclear holocaust. In this program, they will walk you through the results of a nuclear explosion if it were to happen right here on the island of Oahu. As you look and listen, many thoughts will cross your mind. They may be things you don't want to think about, but perhaps the information will help you to make up your mind. The choice will be yours. Let's just imagine a 20 megaton bomb being dropped over Pearl Harbor here, about a mile and a half up in the air. And this is a very likely scenario. What would happen to all the people in the area? What would happen to the things, the buildings and so on? What would happen to the rest of Oahu? I've been in private practice for over 40 years, taking care of the sick, the injured, and the disabled on a one-to-one -one basis. I have suddenly come to realize that it's extremely important that I do the other charge that is given to all physicians, and that is to be concerned about the public health and to try to prevent epidemics. Physicians for Social Responsibility are very much concerned about this, the very last, the ultimate epidemic. 20 megatons. We're trying to imagine an almost unimaginable destructive force. 20 megatons is the equivalent of 20 million tons of TNT, which would require a freight train 200 miles long or 40,000 shipping containers to carry it. 20 megatons is the equivalent of all of the explosives unleashed in all four years of World War II. And it's the same as 14 or 1,500 Hiroshima-sized bombs. And yet 20 megatons is in truth a conservative estimate when one considers that the Soviet Union and the United States have each the equivalent of eight or 9,000 bombs of this size. 
Much of this megatonnage, we must recall, is in the form of much smaller weapons, which undoubtedly would be allocated, many of them, to the outer islands. All of these bombs are loaded, set in position, targeted, and ready to fire at any moment. Ground Zero, the point on the ground directly beneath the bomb burst. It's one o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Curiously, a person standing here at Punchbowl Observation Point, seven miles from Pearl Harbor, would not notice the electromagnetic pulse, though it would destroy all electrical activity in the island, nor the massive lethal initial radiation. If you were here at the moment the bomb exploded, what you would first notice would be a small pinpoint of very bright light over the water. This would rapidly expand to a sphere of intensely hot luminous gases reaching a diameter of over a mile and therefore almost brushing the surface of the earth. Everyone and everything beneath that fireball would be essentially destroyed, turned to ash or vaporized. Human beings would simply disappear. Moments later, the blast wave would arrive, an enormous increase in pressure which would destroy reinforced concrete structures. Following behind the blast wave, powerful winds traveling past this point at supersonic speed would carry everything with them, maintaining gale force as far away as Kailua or Kahuku. As the mushroom cloud rises, consisting of radioactive dust and debris and moisture from the air, it creates a vacuum beneath it and this vacuum would then suck winds back in from the perimeter of the island, and these reverse winds would feed the hundreds of fires which had been started, creating the dreaded firestorm. The heavier fractions of the radioactive debris would soon fall to earth in what the Japanese came to call the black rain to poison the water and food beneath. The lighter particles would reach the stratosphere to be carried to distant points of the globe, creating havoc for generations to come. The life of the land and the life of its people are one. These islands are millions of years old. The generations who have lived for centuries here have developed a unique knowledge of the world and nature and a rich tradition of art, music, dance, religion and history. We of the present generations are still discovering our values, values that could be of use to the whole world. Would we tear it all down in a matter of seconds? When we permit nuclear weapons to exist, we are saying that our many cultures and diversified lifestyles have no worth, no sacred value. Now that we know the general behavior of a bomb, let's consider its effects in more detail. This area here is 7.6 miles across. With Pearl Harbor as center, it includes Hickam Air Force Base, Leeward Community College and Pearl Ridge, Moanalua Gardens, and Honolulu International Airport. Inside this circle, destruction would be total. You would have to walk, starting from the center, for several miles across a desolate and smoking moonscape to reach a pile of rubble barely recognizable as the remains of Salt Lake high-rises. In an area 11.2 miles across, from Eva and Waipahu, eastward to Ivile and Bishop Museum, automobile sheet metal would vaporize and glass would melt, all of this in the first minute or so. Then the blast wave, with winds momentarily reaching supersonic speed, would hit everything from Mililani to Haiku and Alamoana Center to Barbu's Point. Let's continue around the island to bring out the details more clearly. My colleague, Dr. Clifford Straley, Chief of Thoracic Surgery at Kaiser Hospital, will start with downtown Honolulu. Here we are in the heart of the Honolulu Business District. If an atomic device were to explode at one o'clock on a Friday afternoon, thousands of people in these streets would be incinerated instantly. 
and thousands upon thousands of other office workers in these buildings, even if they chanced to be in the deepest recesses of the underground parking garages, would be crushed by the total collapse of the buildings. We estimate that every living creature in this region would die. Aloha oi in an area of about 100 square miles, right around Kalihi here, and between Kapalawa Heights and Eva, which is about a sixth of Oahu, the effects of third degree burns would be so severe that muscles, tendons, nerves, and even bone would be cooked and charred. The effect of the blast and explosion would be such that it would exceed about seven times what an ordinary person could stand and would result in rupture of the lungs, severe hemorrhage, and death by asphyxiation. Between ground zero and here and beyond, it's easy to understand, therefore, that there would be very few survivors, and those that did survive wouldn't last very long. And what medical facilities or personnel would be available to care for anyone? Tripler and Pearl Ridge hospitals would be totally destroyed, their people all dead. At St. Francis and Kuakini and here at Queens, we could hope at best for 10 or 15 percent survivors, and those few would be much too badly injured to care for anyone else. And there's another thing that we don't think about enough. We don't realize our dependency on outside parts of the world here in Hawaii. Surely in an all-out nuclear exchange, hundreds of mainland cities would be destroyed and there is no reasonable way we could expect medical or other help from the mainland. We may live on islands far away from other continents, but we share one thing in common with all of humanity, and that is the threat of complete annihilation. It can come swiftly, so we must act swiftly. Every moment is the right moment to begin. Every person is the right person to act. Do not fear being labeled a radical. After a nuclear exchange, there are no radicals or conservatives. There are no Democrats or Republicans, no capitalists or socialists, just dead people and a few survivors who'd wish they were dead. If you were on a speeding bus heading towards the cliff, wouldn't you want to tell the driver to put on the brakes? About an hour after the bomb is detonated, the firestorm takes over. At first, small, separate fires break out, fueled by wood, chemicals, gasoline, or things like these fuel storage tanks over here. The winds at first blow outward from the blast at well over 400 miles an hour. Then they reverse, sucked into the epicenter by the updraft of the flames themselves. The urban center of the island would become a raging inferno. In fact, it would remain intensely hot long after the flames had died down, just as your campfire will smolder and remain hot long after the flames have abated. Some of you may still harbor thoughts of survival, thinking about bomb shelters stored with food and water. But bomb shelters are lethal. Those in the central area will be destroyed by the blast. Those more peripheral will have the air sucked out of them by the firestorm. During the firestorms of Dresden and Hamburg during World War II, the bomb shelters remained so intensely hot that they burst into flames again days later when they were opened and fresh oxygen was admitted. Bomb shelters after a nuclear explosion will be roasting ovens. In the last 20 years, taxpayers have given billions of dollars for civil defense programs. The government's current plan is to spend billions more for plans to evacuate major U.S. cities in the event of nuclear attack. Among the plans that have been discussed for Honolulu is one that requires Oahu residents to be sent to the neighbor islands, the whole process taking several days. This assumes, of course, that we will have several days warning. But even if we did, can we realistically expect to move close to one million residents and thousands more tourists efficiently and in time? And are the neighbor islands safe destinations? Since military installations are not limited to Oahu, 
the neighbor islands might themselves be targets of nuclear attack. And even if they were not bombed, no island would be safe from the radioactive fallout that can spread for hundreds of miles or more. As a physician, I feel it is wholly unethical to plan for civil defense for nuclear war. It permits people to sit back and do nothing and still hope to survive. Here at Magic Island, we are about 10 miles from Pearl Harbor Ground Zero. This 10-mile circle includes Kaneohe, Kahalu, Waiaholi, Wahiwa, and Lualua Lei in one direction, Diamond Head, Waikiki, and Ala Moana Center on this side. Temperatures here would reach 800 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds would blow in excess of hurricane force at 100 miles per hour. This high rise over my shoulder, while it looks solid enough, would have all of its floors swept from out of it. Kaiser Hospital, Kapiolani Children's, and Castle Hospitals would be destroyed. Buildings of ordinary masonry construction, such as churches, would be smashed flat. Multiple fires would break out from broken gas mains and the like. Optimistically speaking, not more than 20 to 25 percent of people in this area remote from the central blast would still be alive 30 minutes after the explosion. And even they would have to face the firestorm and the delayed radiation still to come. The principal injuries would be simple and compound fractures. A compound fracture means that the skin is torn and the broken bone sticks through. People would have third degree burns, ruptured internal organs, head injuries from flying objects, ruptured eardrums, all of these in various combinations. Those who had chance to look into the fireball would be blind. Their eyeballs virtually melted into their sockets. Now that we are beyond the central area where everybody would have been killed instantly, we should try to imagine thousands of horribly injured people lying in what remains of their streets or wandering about aimlessly, calling for help and seeking water. The injured trapped inside of fallen buildings would have their pleas for help go unheard because, of course, most of the survivors would be deaf. Panic would break out along with the fires. The streets would be impassable. There would be no automobiles, no buses, no telephones, no means of communication or possible avenue of help for the survivors. One moment you would be finishing up your plate lunch or maybe on your way back to work. The next moment you would be walking around in a charred wasteland looking for your friends who were just sitting beside you. The choice is ours. Either we put an end to bombs or they will put an end to us. 14 to 21 miles from ground zero. This area includes Haleiwa, Makaha, Hawaii Kai, Waimanalo, Kailua, Haula, Brigham Young University, and Waimea. Now even at this distance from Pearl Harbor, 21 miles at Waimea Beach, temperatures would be sufficiently high to ignite clothing, and upholstery and heavy cardboard. The winds would reach gale force up to perhaps 100 miles an hour and all manner of objects would fly through the air at high speed, including human bodies until they fetched up against a cliff or wall or house. These winds would blow down probably all utility poles and most frame houses and skull fractures would be extremely common sufficiently severe to cause death even with good care. Second degree burns and worse would be common in all people exposed in the open. And here if you were on a fishing boat even out as far as 20 miles out from the coastline, if you glanced reflexly at the fireball, you probably would be blinded totally and permanently. So, We've seen what nuclear destruction can be for the first few minutes and hours. But what would life be like for the survivors? If indeed you could call it life and you could call it survival. Dr. Tom Hall is the head of the Cancer Control Center of the University of Hawaii. The deaths wouldn't stop when the blast was over. 
and they would continue even after the fireball had exhausted itself. Many of the seriously injured would be in misery for days or weeks without any morphine to alleviate their pain. In addition, radiation sickness would injure many during the immediate blast and even more because of the fallout which would be carried of these radioactive particles as much as 300 miles away. Radiation sickness is a devastating and essentially untreatable disease that affects the rapidly dividing cells of the body so that the bone marrow would be wiped out and no ability to fight infection would remain. The gastrointestinal tract would essentially be sloughed as a mass of dead tissue resulting in bloody diarrhea. The skin, intensely burned, would no longer be able to protect against the loss of water or the intrusion of foreign agents and insects. And the insects, which are deeply resistant to radiation, would then be able to survive and prevail. Even those that didn't have serious physical injuries would have enormous problems in terms of lack of nutrition, the public health problems that arise from thousands of decomposing untreatable corpses, and some degrees of poor nutrition and lack of resistance. What would the result be? Untreatable epidemics of dysentery, skin infections, pneumonia. Another type of epidemic that we would have to deal with is an epidemic of cancer. We have firm data from the experience at Nagasaki and Hiroshima that following the acute blast and radiation sickness damage, there was an acute leukemia epidemic which then followed and lasted for up to five years. There was also an increase in epithelial cancers, particularly of the lung, thyroid, breast, ovary, and stomach, which now have increased and are persisting at five times the expected rate almost 35 years after the event took place. We can expect that in beautiful Hawaii as well, and even more because of the higher intensity of the bombs that are now being contemplated for use. So that the possibility is very strong that 30 years after this horrible event, fully half the people remaining would be dying each year of cancer and of particularly difficult types to treat. The neighbor islands, the rest of the world for that matter, none of it would be safe. Scientists believe that if less than 10% of the current arsenal of the US and the USSR were detonated within a short period of time, that approximately 70% of the ozone layer over the northern hemisphere and perhaps 40% of the ozone layer over the southern hemisphere would be destroyed. The ozone is what protects us from ultraviolet radiation. Without such protection, we would be blind and burned. Now, some of us could wear goggles indeed, but the animals, the birds, the insects would have no such protection. And as a result, cross-fertilization of some of our crops would diminish and our food supply would decline. It would be ecological disaster and the world could return to rocks and water. What does extinction mean? And what difference does it make if we all die? Most of us won't feel it anyway. Here in Hawaii, past, present, and future generations are all one. Even those who have passed before us remain a part of us, just as the children and grandchildren yet to come. Those who are unborn influence our actions today. We plan for the days when they will walk this land. We prepare land housing and resources so that their lives will be fruitful and those of their children's children. When we submit to the threat of nuclear war, when we say that there's nothing we can do about it, we're saying that those children have no right to exist. Is this our moral right? Here we are at Lualule on the Waianae coast. Behind me you see the trigger for a nuclear holocaust here in the Pacific. Lualule is a major communication center for nuclear armed forces. Real people work here. Real people live all around here. 
It's people who vote for candidates, people who pay tax money for government programs, and it's people who push the buttons that start wars. Real people like you and me must prevent a nuclear catastrophe. We mustn't stand by while others tell us whether or not the world will survive. We must take responsibility and preserve this Aina and the life that goes with it. The first thing for us to do is to open our mouths and speak up with family and friends and clubs and organizations and meetings, right to the press, right to politicians. The first time you try it, it may seem strange, but do it and you'll feel better about yourself and about our chances. There is no alternative to this unthinkable, mind-boggling scenario except to eliminate from the surface of this planet all nuclear weapons. All of the citizens of this world, all nations, together, trustingly, must see that this is accomplished. We must turn off the tap that feeds the danger for this last epidemic. We must enact a nuclear freeze. And hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating in Europe, in the Netherlands, in England, in Germany, against our nuclear weapons in their countries. They think if they can live at peace with the Soviet Union, why can't we? Every human society has called our planet Mother Earth. She gives birth to us, nourishes us, permits us to realize our human potential. And when we die, we return our substance to her and she creates the next generation. Is it possible that mankind could destroy its mother? A world that lives half numb, half terror stricken, as a world drained of its energy, energy that should be available for living. We are endangering the human race and perhaps life itself by seeking military solutions for problems that have no military solutions. We think that if the enemy can kill us 10 times over and we can only kill him 20 times over, somehow we are going to win. We may have to change our way of thinking. We may have to change our politics. We may have to start looking at the whole world as our home, not just the islands. There are city, state, and national governments. But which government represents the world? And who speaks for the Earth? The preservation of life is the common concern of everyone on this Earth. Human beings must join in the struggle against nuclear weapons. We must take possession of life and hold it in reverence. Wait a minute, don't you push the nuclear button till I'm done with this song. Wait a minute, did you say it's 1,500 times a bomb that you dropped on Hiroshima? Wait a minute. What's the reason that you say we have to fight to protect our freedom? Wait a minute, please don't think the only solution is a war, cause they only kill our children. Wait a minute, 